Praise the Lord, everybody. If you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Revelations, chapter number 4. Revelations, chapter 4. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. And that is, we're in the midst of the rapture at this point. And we're getting some imagery of what has taken place in heaven at this time. We saw last week that we had the 24 elders, which are the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament and the 12 apostles, but where's the church? And if you look here in verse number 7, it says, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, which is, and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. And we have now these four beasts. They give us a description of what they look like. John says that they have four different face like a lion, a man, a calf, and an eagle. And we find this same description in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 1. So if you go there real quick, this is going to help us to understand who they are. And I'll give you a, a hint. It's not actually four different beasts. But I'll show you. Verse number 5. Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 5. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces. And everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight. And the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sprinkled or sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Now, j just stop for a moment, because I just want to tell you that what Ezekiel is describing here, the four living creatures, the four faces, they had four wings, and how did their feet walk? Their feet walked straight. This speaks to the kind of life that God is looking for out of us. We don't walk backwards. We don't walk to the side. But we walk straight with God. These four creatures that he's describing here are the same four beasts that we see in the book of Revelation. But here, Ezekiel sees them on the earth. On the earth, they had four wings, right? And their feet were like the soles of a cast foot that sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Brass in the Bible is typical of judgment. And that is exactly what we do. Our feet are walking straight. Who do we judge? Nobody. We judge ourselves. See, last week we were talking about having eyes without and within. Now he goes further and says they have feet that are like a calf's foot and like brass. Tells us then that we have to learn how to judge ourselves. We can't veer to the left or right and then say, well, I tried. It's not like that. We have to learn how to walk straight. Jesus made a statement like this. Any man having put his hand to the plow and looked back 
is not fit for the kingdom. Now that's just looking back. How about walking back? That's even worse. So we have to judge ourselves. We have to walk straight. Matter of fact, there's another scripture that tells us that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. Another place that says, he, the, 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 uh, it's in the Old Testament, he said, order my steps in your word. We have to walk the path that God gives us to walk. And it is not always a pleasant path. It is not always what we want or what we expected. However, I'm saying that because sometimes it looks like some people have it easy and others have it hard. But God knows what every single one of us need to make it to heaven. Some people have to have it hard. Some people have to have it easy. And it's not right for us to sit around and then judge God based on what he does for others. How many want to make it to heaven? I know I do. And I want whatever God knows it's going to take for me to make it to heaven. I can't sit around and say, how come I never get anything but, and then start pointing at other folks and say, they always. It's like the scripture I quoted Sunday. The goodness of the Lord leadeth men to repentance, doesn't it? That's what the Bible tells us. For some people, it takes the goodness of the Lord to lead them to repent and live right. And God knows that, and he does all kinds of good things for them because that's what it takes to keep them saved. And for others, the moment he gives us something, we forget about him and go on about our business. So he knows, if I give it to you, you're going to be lost. It should be our prayer, Lord, whatever it takes for me to be saved give me I heard I heard a preacher say this one time he said you know uh, if you tell the Lord whatever it takes well he'll give it to you but you better start looking for trouble in your life I don't agree with that whatever it takes I don't want to say that I missed the rapture and if the Lord had given me just a little more I would have made it I don't want that. Whatever it's going to take, I want that. Because I know that when it's all said and done, it doesn't matter about anything here on this earth. It'll all be gone. And then what? I was, I was uh, studying this, and I got to thinking about those who will be in hell in the lake of fire. And have all eternity to think about what they've done and where they could have been. I don't want that. I don't want to be the one saying, if I only would have. That's a terrible state to be in. He goes on and he says in verse number 10, As for the likeness of their faces, they had four, or they four had the face of a man, and the face of a lion on the right side, and they had, uh, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. Isn't that what we just read about in Revelation? The lion, the man, the eagle, and the ox. So these are connected. But here they've got four wings. Look, verse 11, it says, Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward whither the spirit was to go. They went and they turned not when they went. Again, talking about how are we led by the Spirit? Isn't that what God did with Israel in the wilderness? When the Spirit, when, the, when the, the angel hovered over the tabernacle, 
they pitched their tents and they stayed right there where they were. But when the Lord, when the angel lifted up off of the cloud, I think it describes it as, and then in one place it describes it as the angel of the Lord. When it would lift up off the tabernacle and start to move, they packed everything up and they followed wherever it led them. That's what we're doing right now. Wherever God leads us, that's where we're going. That's where we should be going. But here they had four wings. Two. With two wings they joined together. Which speaks of the unity of God's people. And with two they covered their bodies. What were they doing? It wasn't hiding sin. They were clothing themselves. They were hiding themselves. Their flesh so that only the spirit, where the spirit led them, that's where they went. So they weren't allowing the flesh to even be seen. <clears throat> oh, sometimes we get ugly and it'll, we, we throw it out there, well, I was in the flesh. Flesh shouldn't be seen. We should be one people. We should be joined together as one. And we shouldn't be in the flesh. Friendly today and nasty and rude tomorrow. Nice today and I'm not speaking to you tomorrow. That's not of God. That's the flesh. And that should stay covered. The flesh should stay out of sight. It should only be what's right, what God is leading us in. That's the only thing that we should see. Then he goes on in verse 13. As the for the likeness of the living creatures. Their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went, for, went forth lightnings and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, these four descriptions that's given the man, the lion the ox and the eagle that represents the four gospels the man is Matthew Matthew deals with the nativity of Christ or deals with the natural side of Christ then we have Mark Mark is the lion the book of Mark is bold and it's sharp. It does not, it does not uh, say things in a nice way. It's just blunt. Just like a lion is bold and fierce. Then we have the book of Luke, which represents the ox. An ox is a sturdy animal. It does a lot of work. When you look at the book of Luke, it is written the same way. None of the other Gospels give descriptions and parables like the book of Luke does. And then finally we have the book of John, which is the eagle. The eagle is the highest flying animal, the highest flying bird there is, which represents the divinity of Jesus. It talks about him as a man, but it also describes him as God, higher than any other man, just like the eagle flies higher than any other higher than any other bird Jesus was higher than any other man so we have these four beasts and I've said it a couple of times they had four wings but by the time we get to the book of Revelation how many wings did they have six wings so they had two more wings when we get to heaven what is that talking about well if I can say it this way because it's all symbolic anyway. Now they have an extra pair of wings so they can fly. Amen. How are we getting to heaven? Well, I'm, I'm just saying that like symbolic language, but we're flying there. God's going to take us in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. But they had six wings. Now God gave them an extra pair so they could get up off of this earth. So that's why in the book of Revelation it's described like in the book of Ezekiel. 
but the difference was here they have an extra pair of wings so they could get up off of the earth. Now, these, uh, these beasts, again, talks about they, had, they were full of eyes within. And again, that is important for us because we have to examine ourselves every now and then. Wow, y'all didn't catch that. Every day we have to examine ourselves. Let's go on down and jump down to verse number 10 in, in the fourth chapter of Revelation. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. Now, they fell at his feet. They're the ones with the crowns, right? And what did they do with them? They threw them down. So, really we can't sing, I shall wear a golden crown. Not even the four and twenty elders is going to wear a golden crown. They got it. Symbolic of rewards. They got it. But did they feel worthy of the reward that they got? No. Because once they got to heaven, once we get to heaven, and we compare what we went through compared to what we're getting, we will realize there's no comparison. We're not worthy of the reward that God has given us with the little bit of struggles that we went through. How about this? So you say, well, look at what the apostles went through. The apostle Paul described it as having become a, a laughing stock, a gazing stock. They became nothing so that the church could become something. They were ridiculed and mocked. They were beaten. They were killed. The apostles were all but John. And Paul said, I reckon. Now, Paul was beheaded for Christ. He said, I reckon that the sufferings of this life, and if you read what he says about what he suffered and went through, I don't think any of us would want any of it. He talks about how many times he was stoned. At one point, they thought they killed him and threw him on the trash heap. And that's when he had the revelation or that's when he had the vision of going to heaven. They thought they had killed the man. How many times was he beat? He, he even lists how many times he was beat, 40 stripes, less one. He was put in the sea. How many times he was put in prison? Is that a whole lot of suffering? He said, I reckon that the sufferings of this life cannot be compared. How could he say that? Because he saw it. He knew what we were getting. So all the sufferings that I went through can't compare to what I'm going to get. This is what the four and 20 elders are doing. Once they get there, the reward is so great. Compared to what I went through, they throw them at his feet. Why? It says, because thou art worthy. Isn't that what it says? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. But that's what he gives us. He's given us the church glory, honor, and power. And they took it and said, we're not worthy of this. You only are worthy of this glory, honor, and power. And thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure... They were all created. Now, who is he talking to? Who are they talking to? The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne, right? And worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. This is what they're doing and this is who they're doing it to. They're doing it to the one that's sitting on the throne. And this is the statement that they make. Because you created all things and for thy pleasure they are all or they are and were created. 
Now, in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, who is the image of the invisible God. Now, we're talking about Jesus here. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Now, isn't that the same thing they said about the one sitting on the throne? So who's on the throne? It has to be Jesus on the throne. I feel sorry for the father. Jesus sitting on the throne and, and his dad is standing up somewhere. All right, y'all know I'm, I'm being silly. He said in Revelations 5 and 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Now, that's in chapter 5, verse 1. Is that, is that where we are now? Okay. I saw in the right hand of him a book sealed with seven seals. Now think about it like this. If there are seals around this, seven seals around this book, you can't open this book until all seven seals are taken off. Right? But that's not how this book was sealed. This book was sealed like this. This part had a seal. This part had a seal. This part had... There were seven of them, and each one was sealed. So as he's breaking the seals, more and more of the book is being opened. So this wasn't done in a way to seal the book that it couldn't be opened at all until all seven seals. It was done so that only pieces could be opened a little bit at a time. And as each seal is opened, more and more trouble is poured out on the earth. All of the plagues that are in this book are poured out on the earth. And even more than that, he says, um, in Isaiah chapter 29, Isaiah talks about this book also. In Isaiah 29 and verse 11 it says, And the vision of all is come before, or is come, is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which man delivered to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered unto him that is not learned, saying, Read this. I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, or I am not learned. Now, this is the description that Isaiah gives, but it's also a revelation as to why the world does not understand the Bible. They don't get it. Amen. Why? The most educated men, they go to seminaries, get their PhDs, THDs, DDs, all kinds of letters at the end of their name, and they still don't understand the Bible. Why? Well, they're learned, but why don't they get it? Because they say, I cannot, for it is sealed. They cannot understand the Bible because God has it sealed from them. And then for those who are ignorant and unlearned, they said, well, take the Bible and read it and understand it. And they said, we can't. We're not learned. So whether you're educated or whether you're ignorant, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, this book is sealed from you and you will never understand it. He goes a little bit further. And let's see, where are we? He said worthy. Um, right on the seal, the seven seals. So who was worthy to open it? In verse number two, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open 
the book and to loose the seals thereof. Now we're back in Revelation chapter 5. And verse number 3. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. No man that had been caught up to heaven. No man that was alive on the earth. No man that was dead and buried was worthy to open the book and to look at it. Now, we've seen the book, haven't we? Why are y'all so quiet? We've seen this book. We've read the Bible. We have understanding of what's going on. But we're not worthy. We're not. There's only one that's worthy. So, in verse number four, here's what uh, the angel, the strong angel says. And I wept much, or John said, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, for behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Who was handed the book? Do you remember? It was he that sat on the throne. It was put in his right hand, right? Amen. Now he says, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, look at this. The word lion, capital L. The word root, capital R. That means it's a proper noun. It's a name. So who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Who is the root of David? It's Jesus, right? Amen. He prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And... I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't he just on the throne? Did, did we not just read that? He was on the throne, and they gave him the book. Now, he's in the midst of the elders and the four beasts. How can he be in the midst of the beast and the elders and yet he's on the throne? Now this is last week I was talking about this. Go ahead. Yes. He said he, he's dwelling with us. Yes, because we are the judgment seat. We are the throne of God. It's symbolic. We are where he sits. It, it, doesn't the Bible say that he had a desire to dwell, to tabernacle among men, that he wanted to have a house not built with hands, but one that he built. So he made us, and he dwells in us. But when we get to heaven, now he's on us. We are the throne of God. That's why he can be sitting on the throne and yet be in the midst of it. He can be in the midst of us because we are the throne. I hope this is making sense. It says, There stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Don't be, don't be thrown off by that. He tells you what it is. Which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The seven spirits of God that was sent forth in the earth. Um... That is when he was here during the seven church ages. It's not that God has seven spirits. It's that God's spirit has been here throughout every church age. So we go on. And let's see, we're in verse number, where are we? Verse, we just ended six, all right. In verse number seven, and he came and took the book 
out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Hold up. He was on the throne. Then in the midst of it, he already had the book in his right hand. Now he comes and takes the book out of his own hand. Now let me just say this. People who don't get it say, who was Jesus? If Jesus and God are the same person, who was he praying to? Who was Jesus praying to? To himself? Well, that makes him schizophrenic, doesn't it? He's just talking to his own self. It, being smart alecky. Well, God is way more than anything we can comprehend. He can be on the throne with the book in his hand. He can be in the midst of it and come and take it out of his own hand. You can't, you can't narrow God down with human thinking. He comes and takes the book. He changes roles. Remember the Sardis stone? The Sardine stone? Okay, well, we looked at him one way. He's sitting on the throne. Then when it was time for somebody to open the book, we turn it just a little bit. Now he's the lamb taking the book from his own hand. If you think that's too complicated, how about when Jesus died and resurrected? got up from the grave, took his own blood to heaven, put it on the altar in heaven as the high priest. First he was the lamb. Then he took his own blood as the high priest, went into the tabernacle, put it in the heavenly tabernacle, which he is, and we'll see that in the book of Revelations later on. He is the, the, the tabernacle. And then as God accepted that blood offering Amen. and then turned around a few hours later, left heaven and came back to earth. Come back as a risen savior. Amen. If you think God can't do it all, all by himself, then you don't understand God. Amen. He is the lamb and he is the one that sits on the throne. He's the one that sits on it and in the midst of it, he's all of that. We go on to verse number eight. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Our prayers are being bottled up. Now, we'll see why, but I want you to consider this. Our prayers are important. Amen. They really are. And God keeps track of it. And we'll see later on when we are there, he turns around and he gives us back our prayers. And there's a reason why he does it, but he gives our prayers back. If you want to be able to get the prayers, you got to give them first. You're not getting to heaven and getting your prayers back. And you say, well, you know what? I want more. Well, you should have gave more. Took our prayers and bottled them up. And then in chapter 8, he gives them back. We're not going there yet. But in chapter 8, he gives them back. And oh, is the world sorry that he gave us our prayers back. All right, in verse number 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now think about this. There's roughly 6,500 languages spoken on the earth today. There are people who spend their life categorizing them. So this isn't just a wild guess. There are those who track down uh, different languages. I know in movies, um, linguists in movies are people that they say... Um, 
they can speak many different languages. But that's not true. A lot of linguists can only speak one language. They just understand the rules of language. They help categorize languages. We're losing languages all the time. But here, he said, out of every kindred, every tongue, that's every language. God's got people everywhere. Amen. It's estimated that 28 language groups since 1960 have been completely lost. But I can't imagine how many there was when God at the Tower of Babel, when he divided the tongues of people, how many have just died out completely? How many have gone extinct because of entire nations being wiped out during battle? We don't know. But God's got people from every tongue. That doesn't mean that there's going to be somebody from every single language. All this means is God does not discriminate based on your language. Every tongue has an opportunity to be saved and to live right. And we'll see this, we'll see this as we go, that not everybody that gets to heaven is there because they had the Holy Ghost. Amen. Some people are just righteous. But we had that. The, the, the term people, um, it, it covers the, I'm trying to think what we call them today, the, um, the person that, that doesn't feel like they belong to any group. Uh, I don't claim any nation as my home. I don't claim any country as my home. We got folks like that today. And I'm sure they've had them throughout history. Those who separate themselves off and don't want to be a part of any government. That's peoples. Nations, those are the ones that are under governments. So every kindred tongue and people. According to the United Nations, there's 201 nations on the planet today. Of them, 193 are members of the United Nations. Two of them are observer states. They can go and observe. Oops. I'm saying that word wrong anyway. They observe what's going on, but they don't have the right to vote. The rest are just out there. All we know is this that the number count of all of the groups in heaven is a hundred million people and that's just those that are raptured that's a lot of folks but it's from every nation kindred tongue and people in verse number 11 it says and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So now we've got two groups of people. We've got the 10,000 times 10,000. And then we've got the thousands of thousands. Right? Yeah. All right. So in the book of Daniel, he tells us the difference between the two groups. In the book of Daniel chapter 7. Or Daniel chapter 7 it says in verse number 9 I beheld till thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire <clears throat> isn't that kind of like what he was describing earlier in the book of Revelations well verse number 10 and a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And judgment was set, and the books were opened. So we're still talking about what's going on in Revelation, but Daniel had a different perspective on it. But he said the thousand thousands were what? He said, thousand thousands ministered. That's the angels. 
book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he tells you that he makes his angels a flame of fire, ministers, ministering to the people. That's what they're here for, is to minister. So the thousand thousands, that's angels. The 10,000 times 10,000, that's the church. That's 100 million. Yes, sir. The 100 million is the church. Okay, so the Old Testament saints. Old Testament, New Testament, because there was a church in the Old Testament. Right. And uh, where, who was the original, the very first prophet of the Lord? Does anybody know? Adam. You say Adam? Any, anyone else? Melchizedek? Melchizedek? Anybody else? <coughs> <laughs> he said, I know it was Abel after him. I got scriptures. You, you, well, uh, well, then how do you know Adam? You're saying Adam. How do, well, the Lord said that he's had prophets, the prophets that have been here since the beginning of time. When did that start? With Adam. So he was the first, and God's had prophets in every generation, every dispensation. Every group of people have had somebody to tell them about the Lord. Who did Adam tell about the Lord? Well, we see his children, Cain and Abel. What are they doing? They're offering up a sacrifice to the. How did they know? What? God didn't come down and teach them. How did they know? Because Adam told them how to serve the Lord. Anyway, uh, in the book of Jude, he says that he comes back with. Ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. So now just think about this, and then I'm going to get your question. Just think about this. In Jude, he talks about from the time of Enoch. There are those who find religious artifacts dating way back before Israel was even a people. And uh, Gilgamesh is one of them, the poem of Gilgamesh. And they talk about different things, the flood and the serpent. And they say, you see, the church took this from these ancient religious people and wove it into their religious worship. That is not true. They stole it from the true people of God. Adam was preaching. Enoch was preaching. Seth was preaching. Abel was preaching. These were all people that knew the plan of God, knew what God was doing. And other folks come by later, stole it, and now they're saying because they wrote it down and the others didn't, oh, well, then the others must have stole it from the ones that wrote it down. That's not true. From the time of Adam, they've been preaching about the Lord coming back. Enoch prophesied that the Lord was coming back with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on this wicked world. This has been, this has been preached on since way before uh, six, Adam, the flood came 1656 years after, after Adam. Long before that. Less than a thousand years much less than a thousand years after human beings was on the planet, they were already preaching the gospel. They were already preaching the truth or the gospel of their day. Not the death, burial, and resurrection, but they were preaching what God wanted Amen. even back then. God has always had somebody that was serving him. You can say, you can say, well, ain't nobody else doing it, so why should I? Well, Noah has a good reason why. Because God will save just eight if he wants to. Can't get no attitude about what everybody else is doing. You just need to make sure you're doing what you should be doing. That's all. So, Daniel tells us that the 24 elders and the four beasts represent the 100 million in the glorified church from Adam 
all the way to the rapture. Now let's jump down to verse number 12 in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That's some kind of song, isn't it? <laughs> and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. How many is sitting on the throne? It says to him. Singular. I'm harping on this because there is over 1,100 verses in the Bible that show you that God is one. There's only one scripture that might make you think he's not. They, the nominal church, because the word is sealed to them, will take the one and ignore the 1100. Amen. Build a religion, a doctrine, and a principle all off of that one verse and make it the cornerstone of their belief. And will tell us, they'll tell us, that we are, uh, not only are we wrong, but we're apostate, that we are against God, that we are going to hell because we deny the Father and the Son. No, we don't. We accept them. They're denying him. They won't accept who he is. Him that sat on the throne, it says, and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth under the earth such as are in the sea and all that are in them God knows every single person that has ever lived where they lived how they lived when they died and how they died and what kind of life in between all of that he knows every single one whether they're in the sea Amen. in the ground whether they're alive or whether they're in heaven, he knows all of them. Every creature, he said, is going to hear. What are they going to hear? Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. They're going to hear it. Dead and living. Well, how are they going to respond to it when they hear it? Romans chapter 14, verse 11 and 12. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Who are they giving the account to? Him that sitteth on the throne. Now he says God here, but in the book of Revelation it says to the Lamb that's sitting on the throne. That's who they're going to give the account to. So how can the lamb get the account and God get the account unless they're both the same person? Amen. They're going to give an account to God. And this book, what's written in this book, uh, does anybody know what's in the Bible? The judgments of God. God's judgments are in this book for those who refuse to serve and worship him. Uh, we were just talking the other day and was talking about how can you imagine and we're going to see next week we're going to start with the first seal that's opened and we will see the, the problems that God is bringing on the earth as he breaks open each one of these seals. Each time he brings more and more and more trouble on the earth. By the time we get to the sixth seal, a quarter of the earth's population will be dead. Now think about this. One fourth of all humans will be dead in three and a half years. And that's just the beginning of trouble. 
They haven't even started yet. Because by the time we get to the end of the last half of the tribulation, it says one or two out of every three will be dead. There will only be one-sixth of the human population, 20% left alive at the end of the tribulation period. God is bringing destruction on this planet on a scale that man can't even begin to understand. It's coming. And we had better be ready. Because if we have to go through the tribulation, that's just the start of our problems. If you have received the baptism in Jesus' name and received the Holy Ghost, and you missed the rapture, you can pray to live through the tribulation if you want. That's just the start of your trouble. Because where does judgment begin? The house of God. It starts right with us. And God's not given anyone a chance to get to the court of appeals. It doesn't work that way. We have a chance to get it right now. During the tribulation, if you are not living right now and you have the Holy Ghost, there's no way you'll be able to live right during the tribulation. You can't do it. It's not possible. First of all, forget about the fact that judgment begins with the house of God and we've already been judged and found guilty. Forget that. If you can't live for God, you're sure not going to die for him. You just won't do it. You think that when problems start happening on the world, you're just going to line up, hey, yep, come on and kill me. I'll tell you something. There's a point in here where men want to die. And God said, won't let you. They'll cry for the mountains to take their life, for, for rocks to fall on them and kill them. And God said, they can fall on you, but you won't die. Oh, that's going to be a terrible time. So you, even if you got to the point to where you said, uncle, I'm ready to die. The Lord will say, nope. I won't even let you do that. And that's just the start of trouble. Because if you get to die during the tribulation, that just means now you're in the holding pattern for the lake of fire. That's all. If you've been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, you don't get to go to the white throne of judgment. You come into the throne of judgment every time you come to church. You come into the throne of judgment now. That's why he tells us, judge yourself now so that you won't have to be judged later. Judge yourself now. We're judging ourselves. And if you're found guilty, clean it up and get it right. But after the rapture, you don't have to worry about going to the white throne of judgment. You've already been to the judgment seat and already found guilty. No point in bringing you back for a second hearing. You're already guilty. Amen. Amen. I mean, that, that, we, we should get it straight, shouldn't we? Amen. I don't want to be here. And, and I'm telling you, I'm just glossing over, giving you the cliff's notes. <laughs> this is nothing. When you start seeing what God is going to do, right. Amen. Oh, we ought to be very careful people making sure that we're doing what God wants us to do. Amen. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. The rapture. Chapter 4 and 5 is the rapture of the church. I wouldn't really have any other title for it that I could think of other than this is what's taking place just before God begins in earnest to pour out trouble on the earth. I believe I've heard it said that, um, yes, I have. I have heard it said that, that you know, we're talking about the mark of the beast during the tribulation period. The mark of the beast doesn't even start until three and a half years into the tribulation. So it's not like the day of the rapture, the beast is revealed right. and uh, the, the, everybody has to take his mark. It's not like that. <coughs> we get to go to heaven in the rapture. We get to go to heaven and God... It's, I don't know, again, I'm, I'm saying like I did last week, I don't know the time period between the rapture taking place and the lamb receiving the book 
and begin to open the seals on the earth. I don't know if it's a day. I don't know if it's a half a year or a month or a few minutes. We don't know. But you will see, starting next week, you will see the seals of that book begin to get broken open. And as each seal is broken, it becomes terrible here on the earth. God brings all kind of plagues on them. Amen. It's going to be bad. So chapter 4 and 5 is just simply the rapture of the church when we first get to heaven and the, the beginning or the origin of how the trouble begins on the earth during the tribulation. That's what it brings us up to that. And we see now how is all this trouble going to happen in seven years? Well, because the seals are being broken open. But that doesn't happen until chapter 6, starting at verse number 1. Anything else? All right, stand on your feet.